And the, you know, the catalyst for this content that we've been collaborating on is, you know, we see a lot of companies that as they go from an, a disconnected on-prem technology and they start to move to as a service and it's now connected, they're missing the point. They're missing the point of all the potential and new value propositions that they can unlock. And even for the born in the cloud companies, there's many of them that are missing the point. So we want to really talk about what are the compelling winning attributes here um, in as a service offers. And I'll just give you some quick uh, baseline here. Uh, again, the challenge is that our very lucrative high margin revenue streams are under duress. What's growing as a service? The, the SaaS, um, managed services, that's what's growing. That's why you see so much investment in this. And so we're going to open up here with our very first poll, just because I want to make sure you're awake here, paying attention. So it is growing as a service revenue a high priority at your company, yes or no? And as the data will start to come in, I hope people are getting more comfortable using the uh, polling, the polling app. The game you might be playing here is, is there going to be even one no vote? Okay, finally. Okay, we got one no <laughs> <laughs> We got one no vote coming in here. So, and I like to play the game here where I, where I get a little critical mass on votes, so. And hopefully we don't have any, I have no idea. Yeah, I have no ideas, yeah. Oh, oh we do, okay. I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, then the answer is probably no. Um, so good, I, lo I love to get the data here. So I'll let it ring just a little bit more. Okay, that's perfect. So this is a clear like 90-10 rule, right? And so this is important to pretty much everybody uh, in, the, in the room. Um, but we have to have offers that keep the money on the table. This is the, uh, the as-a-service waterfall, right? And so these are all about recurring revenue streams. You, you get the customer on that offer and you don't want them to churn, you don't want them to downsell you, you know, they want, they want to pay less. What you really want to do is keep them and expand them right, and, and, and grow that revenue stream. So you need compelling offers uh, to do that. But we, we know that, um, you know, born in the cloud companies struggle with profitability. If you compare a SaaS companies over $500 million in revenue to um, mature traditional software companies, there's no comparison in terms of the profitability. So that is one of the, the themes that you see with as a service companies is, you know, how can we bring in more margin dollars? So let's do another quick poll. So we know that 90% of you care about growing these revenues. Is profitability yet an important concept? I know for some of you it may not be, but um, is improving profitability a high priority? Um, yes or no? Uh, people are getting much faster at voting. I like this. Had a half a day of learning. Numbers are pretty big here. I am surprised. But that's good. So we're heading now to another 90-10 roll. About 90%, well, maybe 80% now, because some of you have n no idea. Um, but at least 80% of you care about profitability. So if we cut back to the slides, we want to grow these revenues. We want them to be profitable. They need to be compelling. And again, this is where we're missing the trick. What are compelling as a service offers? And we've got to close this gap down that JB talked about this morning between being all about feature functionality and being more about value realization. And at TSIA, when we look at this, this digital transformation uh, journey, we talk about two value vectors. One value vector with customers as they move to as a service is just you know, getting things into the cloud, tearing down data centers, you know, uh, reducing operational complexity. But that's just the first value vector. There's a second value vector that now you have people in this connected posture. You're getting telemetry you never had before. And what are you going to do with that telemetry? Right? You want to get on this train where you're putting new tools around it, AI, machine learning, et cetera, to unlock new value propositions with your customer. And I'll give a simple example that I love to use, and that is with email. When email was run on-premise, disconnected, right, you get your email delivered. But now that email is in the cloud, you know, companies like Microsoft and others run all these analytics on it, and they basically, you know, I, I love this personally because I get these reports telling me, hey, Thomas, you don't have enough focus time, you're overbooked, hey, hey Thomas, you know, you, there are these four commitments you made in email. 
have you closed those down yet? I mean, this, this is all a new value proposition from this ancient thing called email. And so it's an example of, it's not just about the technology, it is about connecting to KPIs, business KPIs, to the business outcomes your customers care about. So, what makes a compelling as a service offer? This is this paper that we worked on, and I know it's a little bit of an eye chart, I apologize, but these are the, these are the attributes that we're gonna, that we're gonna gnaw on here this afternoon. So we, we believe that there are, what, eight compelling attributes with as a service offer. So again, as you, as you get customers in this posture, what are you doing for them? So reducing operational complexity. Are you now giving them pay as they go uh, uh, pricing options they never had before? What are the in enhanced uh, insights? Are you making it easier for them to actually adopt and use the technology in a way that you couldn't before, et cetera, et cetera? What are the compelling attributes that you're putting on the table? And, and Laura, I want to bring you in here because, you know, you made the point that there's, there, there's a difference between value and outcomes, and you see, you know, people get confused on this, so. Yeah, I, I always find that it's helpful just to, you know, identify those two, two things. Um, folks talk about value propositions and value realization and outcomes and so forth. But we think about value, value is the customer's willingness to pay for something that contributes to the outcome that they're after. Now, your product might contribute value to some other business outcome, and maybe they need products from all sorts of companies to actually achieve the outcome that they, they're after. Um, but their business outcome is a result of you know, a set of conditions, a set of um, products, if you will, that will ultimately contribute to that, yeah, that yeah. outcome. So a little bit different. Yeah, I think it's an important contribution. Di yeah, th distinction. And so if we focus on this word outcome, so we think this is one of the compelling attributes that you could, could put on the table, for an as-a-service offer, do you have as-a-service offers that are focused on helping the customer achieve strategic business outcomes? Yes or no? Because we know you want the revenue, we know you want them to be profitable, now are you stepping up and unlocking outcomes? And the percentages are a little bit lower than the first two polls. <laughs> Just a little bit lower. A little bit more real. A little bit more real, right? So now we have to earn our keep. We have to earn the revenue. We have to earn the profitability. So this is, this is coming in about 50-50. Um, and so about half of you are saying, yes, we're doing this, which is fantastic. It's an important attribute. Um, but many of you are not doing this. So, so let's go to the next uh, slide here. And thank you so much for being quick on the, on the, on the voting. Um, so Laura, I think this is, this is one of your data points here on this gap. Actually, if I could talk Oh, about that's it. yours, okay, yeah. I really like this one because when you look at the left of this data point, <clears throat> we all agree customers desire value and outcomes, right? We agree on this. But then when we ask, do we have it in our strategy? Do we have a strategic intent to deliver the outcomes? Look at that number drop. And then when we go to, do you have offers and pricing based on outcomes, it drops even far further. Yeah, it's it, interesting, interesting yeah. to note that the group here uh, reported at 50% more or less yeah. that they have, that there are outcome-based yeah. offers, which is a little higher than what we see yeah, which in, is the, good. in the data, which is good, directionally correct. So, well, and, and I think what is interesting is I know by looking at all your websites that you're all talking on your websites about unlocking business outcomes for your customers. So we've, you know, and I was talking to a member the other day and they said, well, how long do you, should you go on with this sort of fake it until you make it thing? And I'm like, yeah, I think you want to close that gap as soon as you can, okay? So it, part of closing that gap on outcomes is really segmentation. And, I, and you were talking about this in, in, in your power hour, how important that is. And so, you know, you're chasing outcomes. Another, and the questions get harder, right? The bar keeps getting higher. Do you define outcome metrics for each customer segment? So do you have specific outcomes that you're chasing based on a segment, or are you just chasing some, you know, some, some big um, you know, common outcomes that you think apply to all customers? Let's see how sophisticated we're getting here. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, and the votes are coming in, which is great. I love the fact that folks have figured this out. So, I mean, this is, this is a 90-10 you know, rule the other way. So um, mm -hmm. we have very broad outcomes, and we believe that part of this journey that we're on to, to, to unlock more value for our customers 
is verticalization, it is not being a blunt instrument, you know, a horizontal offer into the world because different cover customer segments do have, um, you know, different specific outcomes to chase. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I'm not a surprise. Um, and so this one here, do you define yeah, this Yeah, so out? this yeah. one, uh, this is, so I appreciate the intellectual honesty of the, of the group here because you're saying the majority of you basically don't, haven't identified those outcomes for um, all of your customer segments. Uh, this data point was uh, uh, part of our, our benchmark, which shows a number of customers have done that. And I, that's the first step, right, is doing that deep discovery with the customer um, and with the, with the vertical and really understanding what their business processes are and what they are trying to achieve. And then ultimately how your product's gonna fit into that equation and help them move towards it. Uh, but this is where it starts. Yep, this is absolutely. Where it starts. Absolutely. And, and then there's another gap here, right? Yeah, absolutely. So another part of the gap, obviously, if you have value and outcome based offers, but the ability to measure those outcomes. Right. Right. Um, and that contributes hugely to the tangibility of the value that you're contributing towards that, um, which in turn affects, goes all the way back to that waterfall uh, earlier, right? It affects um, your ability to preserve, uh, preserve value in the sale and price, um, price accordingly. So again, I'm just going to play back what we're learning here. We, we, on our websites, we all talk about delivering outcomes. We want to be able to position that way. But, uh, you know, do we have outcomes that are specific to customer segments? Typically not. We have a gap in our ability to actually measure those outcomes. And ultimately, that can cause some pain. That can uh, cause some absolutely. pain. Absolutely. So when we look at, you know, I've just talked about the discovery, right? If you look at the obstacles to, to this, having the method, methodology to be able to go and discover what those business outcomes may be. Um, and the tools to translate that then into um, some value propositions that, that make sense. And I think organizational obstacles, and we're going to talk, I think, a little bit about that in a moment, um, but really kind of the product and services, how do they work together to ultimately help the, the customer achieve the outcome because they're not separated. And then if you don't have this, in the face of this gap, we see all sorts of downstream symptoms that are not positive, right? right? So if you're shifting left and you're defining those outcomes um, and you're building solutions to address them, the right thing, m more right things start to happen downstream with sales, with helping with customer success, helping customers realize those, uh, realize the, the value of uh, what you have. and the ability to renew um, more easily. Because if your offers aren't inherently designed, right, for, for value and outcomes, then everybody's compensating yeah, downstream. Absolutely. Yeah, again, I mean, this, this fake it until you make it is not the winning strategy mm -hmm. <laughs> on outcomes. And now, but here, there is good news on this. I mean, I will say, you know, this paper on a primer for outcome engineering, I, that's got to be, what, four or five years mm -hmm. old, and we refreshed it. Um, you know, since that paper, I first wrote that, I mean, it, there is progress on this. I mean, I think we are seeing it, I think both of you are seeing it with your members that, you know, we're, we're, we are building the muscle. There's good framing out there. There's good content out there to, to, to learn from. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we are making progress, but you can see from that data, uh, there's, there's a lot of headroom on, on that attribute of outcomes. Now, here, here's another attribute, a compelling attribute. Offers that are priced based on consumption. And this, you know, in the last, year and a half, this has skyrocketed, right, in terms of, especially SaaS companies that used to be user-based pricing, going to consumption-based. We were just talking um, over the weekend about the extreme example of Autodesk, where they are, it's consumption-based on a 25 or 24 hour mm -hmm. basis, right? You use your credits, you turn on a particular product, 24 hours later, are you still using it or you're not? We turn it off and you can use credits on a different one. So this is you know, going to the extreme. So let's see how we're doing on this one. Do you have any offers that are based on consumption? And the votes come in and we're sitting at about 50-50. It's interesting how the percentages don't change a lot even though it's like, it's like a very strong signal right away. Um, so this is about 50-50, so but think about that. I mean, you know, JB was talking about this morning when we wrote consumption economics and people were like, I don't really think it's gonna go there. Well, it's going there and, and, and it's getting you know, e even uh, more heat on that topic. So let's go back to the slides. Um, so here's on pricing anchor pra practices. Yeah, so you, know, you see per unit of consumption here. Um, this is again out of the uh, benchmark. 
I'm very encouraged to see more and more offers being priced based on value metrics or consumption, as ultimately it's a similar kind of a thing, right? Where you are, you're using the solution, you're getting value out of it, and the metrics are going up. And it shows that ultimately that the, the offers and the customer are aligned in terms of what they both want. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. I think uh, per user pricing, um, still pretty prevalent. We've seen a lot of mix between um, you know, doing some per user pricing, but then doing some per value metric layered in on top of that. And one of the beauties of consumption and value metric pricing, of course, is that you can, you, you're not bound by an artificial you know, number of employees of a company. Right, if you align aligning to a value metric or by unit of consumption, if it's if it's something different, that can actually be so much larger and have so much more potential. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, again, a, an important attribute. It, it, it's, it's compelling for your customer because they're in a sense only paying for what they're using. You know, they they like those types of models. Um, and again, a lot of heat on that uh, that particular attribute. So another one, and it's the one I shared earlier with the email example, is, is, is unlocking new analytical insights that you could not unlock when the product was disconnected and you did, did not know what the customer was doing with it. So do you have any as-a-service offers that provide new analytical insights to customers? Is this an attribute that we have in play? And let's, let's uh, cut over and see. Wow, this is encouraging. This is very encouraging. Uh, and of course, if you're going to prove the value and deliver outcomes, <coughs> you need the data. You need right? the data. But having said that, uh, uh, we used to have a saying at, um, at TSIA, when we actually when we wrote Consumption Economics, and JB uh, called it the data piling up in the corner. So there were a lot of SaaS companies that had this telemetry, and it was just piling up, and there were no new insights being unlocked. So it's still a relatively new muscle. Uh, but this is really, this is fantastic, right? The fact that it's, it's closer to a 60-40 rule. I think, again, we're learning uh, you know, a lot there. Um, uh, so that's a great one. Let's go back here. And so let's take a look here on what analytics are providing. What type of information are we looking at here? It's interesting when we look at this. I love that data piling up in the corner idea. <laughs> I've laughed at that from the first time I read it, and it's still funny. When we ask in the service offer management backup, are you collecting data from your customer's use of your technology? Of course, most people say yes. And then we ask them what they're collecting. And what we get is a lot of what you see on the left of this slide. We see basic usage reporting we see usage analytics. But when you start stretching into that benchmarking, that benchmarking that customer, telling them what good looks like in their industry for customers like them, now you're starting to talk about a value you can directly monetize. And if you can get predictive about that, if you can get even further to prescriptive about that, you're in a very small minority, but that's the rarefied air where the industry is going for the successful members of that industry. So it's interesting when you see that monetization threshold appear right there in the middle. I would argue we've got a lot of data. We're not monetizing it very well. And some, in some cases, that's because we haven't quite moved to the right side of this diagram. Yeah, and, and on that example, I mean, monetizing, for, you know, I have seen some of the SaaS companies that did figure this out, right? And they're like, hey, I can really provide some great insights. I can benchmark my customer, tell them what good looks like for a company their size and their industry, and I can give all this great insight. And oh, by the way, here you go for free. <laughs> there you go. I think I think that not the winning strategy. There's real business value there that you should not, you know, be shy about um, charging as you unlock that incremental value. Um, so we have a, a question here around how you're working to, un to to identify these compelling attributes and get them in play. So do your product management and service offer portfolio management teams actively collaborate on offer and pricing development? So fully. Um, now, so yes, but you know, not probably enough collaboration or a flat out no. What are you seeing there? And obviously we're asking this because this is a, uh, an important success tactic that we have seen. So how are you doing on this one? Yes, yeah, This fully. is kind of what I would expect. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I like to see this stuff unfold real time here. So the um, so it's good. I mean, over half of you saying yes at some level. So that's good because we still see complete stovepiped. You know, the old way of building tech, right? Product says, "I got this new tech. Here you go, services. Figure out how to install it and train people on it." Over the wall it goes. Um, so it's 
it, it, you know, it's good that there's more collaboration, but it needs to be fully. Uh, and why? Because again, when you start to go after outcomes, when you start to go after these analytical insights, when you start to go after accelerating adoption, you, you know, the, the product and service team have to be in sync, and the product team has got to be throwing off the, te the telemetry that you need to unlock those value propositions. So another good data point to share. And yeah, so some of the roles that we're seeing in play here, how's this yeah. playing out? So, you know, the product teams, and this diagram illustrates really the product teams and the service teams are all focused on, on that customer, right? And the product teams tend to be looking at it from a, you know, bringing in, how's my, how am I going to differentiate my technology? How am I going to, how are we going to grow this market? How are we going to compete? Um, and then the service teams tend to, not all cases, right, but tend to be looking at how do I maximize existing customer revenue, right? So they're two slightly different viewpoints, but when you think about as a service, we know now that growth has got to be advised by the customer journey, right? And it's got to get, and then we've got to prescri prescribe how we want the customer to take that journey with our solutions in order to help them achieve those outcomes. So it really requires that a, a good degree of collaboration between these two teams. You know, you could argue that you've got the technology there. When, when do you deliver the services, right? Hal and I talk about this a lot. Um, you know, ha and how does, that, how does that look holistically along that journey? You know, and I think what's interesting in, in, in this sort of area of collaboration, so we have been advocating on the services side, right, that if you're going to really put compelling offers on the table. You can't do that in a stovepipe manner where you have support offers being defined over here, professional services over here, education over here, and they're not really talking to each other. So the first move on the chessboard is to see a rationalization of the service portfolio where you have you know, one team thinking the complete thought. And, and give me sort of a state of that. Are we seeing that more often now, that type of rationalization? We are. We're, I think we're, we're hitting the wall of reality that we don't have the luxury of optimizing single service lines anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just not interesting to yeah. our customers. It's not interesting to our bottom line. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the first move. And then the, the second move is, is this now the service and the product teams being much more collaborative. Right. And, and some companies actually having the, you know, there is a team that owns the offer, the complete offer. Yeah. I think that's still a minor, minority practice, but we are starting it to see it in the a wild. Minority. And you see it maybe in that data where folks have said they have a very tight collaboration going on. Maybe they are looking yeah. at that complete, that complete offer. And we have talked about the complete offer. It's that combination of technology, services, data, and analytics, right, that it's advised by the customer journey. Um, and so to do that complete offer, which you're going to need for these value and outcome-based offers, it's got to have all of those pieces. You really need to have that, that level of collaboration. But m we're, not, we're not there yet. Um, and I think yeah, this, yeah, this next slide kind of right? shows that, right? So the pervasive behavior, even in the, you know, companies that are on the move to as a service and the born in the cloud companies, this behavior has, has been pervasive for a very long time. So it's technology, develops the technology, works with their product marketing folks and puts that out into the market. And then the service portfolios are attached and taken to market by a separate services marketing team. Right? So these things are parallel, and as you saw in the data, levels of collaboration, but for the most part siloed. Well, and that reality plays right back to the opening keynote with that picture of the, the garden maze there, right? And the, the complexity we are creating for our customers by going to market that way. Yeah, I love that rose garden yep. thing. I can <laughs> see product and services walking down the aisle together. <laughs> there, there you go, there you go. <laughs> But I think, and, and you, so you two have some, some data here in terms of how much of this is, is, is actually happening. Yeah, when you, when you look at these services convergence effects specifically, um, we ask about that, we have asked about that for the last few years in the organizational survey. And it's interesting, we ask, do you have a distinct organization called services portfolio management? And you can see the results here. <clears throat> and you can see that from a hardware perspective, it's a growing practice. From a software, it's holding about the same. And in SaaS, it's just dropped. And so we found it interesting, if you roll to the next bit of data, we also ask, are you doing joint cross-service line collaboration? Which you would assume is something that happens more when you have the services portfolio position as an org. But it looks like we're seeing a jump in SaaS. So maybe without the organization change, we're still seeing more joint cross-service line work. 
And that would argue for the point that you need to be doing it one way or another, whether the org changes or not. Yeah, yep, absolutely. And, and again, this is an area where there's some good content on how to organize for success here. I think we, you know, it becomes clearer and clearer what the best and winning practices are on this that really accelerates, you know, you're, you know, taking out complexity, creating, you know, more compelling offers. So I would definitely, you know, click into that. Um, I as well, because I think that that is uh, an important way to unlock these new values. And thanks so much for, for coming and enjoy uh, the rest of the afternoon here. Thank you.